Hey hey everybody, welcome to the Covers and Co. Intercrop webinar. Um, we got a few more people coming in, but I'm going to yammer on here for a little bit. Thanks to our panelists and everybody for hopping on. Um, yeah, just going to go through the ground rules, how we've kind of done these things before. Um, the questions, Travis, is it questions going question and answer? Yep. So the questions go in question and answer, not in the chat box. Um, so yeah, you can see the two boxes, they go in the Q&A box instead of the chat. Same as always, we're going to go through, these guys are going to go through their presentations. We're going to come back at the end to everyone's questions, so throw them in there and I will um, go through the questions. Trap, if you want to go to the next one. We got the same giveaways uh, as always. I got a Covers & Co hat right here. We're going to give away to one of the um maybe most thought-provoking questions and then we got uh a boyd's beef hat as well ryan boyd's uh one of our panelists tonight their uh their farms direct marketing beef and we've also got nick cowan from billy's beef uh these guys are doing the lord's work and and <laughs> direct marketing beef which it, or or any products which isn't a pile of fun so uh you know if you're looking for better quality products at you know the same or slightly more cost, you know, support these farms and support, you know, the work they're putting in both on their farms and from, uh, you know, direct marketing standpoint. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of promoting these on purpose. Uh, all, all the farms that we are um, talking about, like with our free giveaways, all their information is on our website. So stop in, check them out. They're all doing awesome work. And uh, yeah, it's about the only way we can actually uh, turn a profit with uh, con or conventional or uh, cow calf beef production. So, please, we're serious. We we want um, people supporting um, our local uh, direct market farms. So check them out on our website and uh, yeah, get your questions in the box and we'll get rolling here. So, like I was saying, our three panelists: Ryan Boyd, Nick Cowan, their uh, mixed grain and cattle operations, and then Alex Borsch. He was on last week, Alex talking about getting started with soil health, going to talk about some intercrops they do on their uh, grain farm. And they're kind of a unique situation where they've got conventional and organic production. And uh, yeah, I know Alex has expressed to me some interest in, in animal integration as well. So we're going to get the broad spectrum here tonight. Again, questions in the Q&A section and uh, yeah, we'll get rolling. So actually, before we start, I know one of the biggest uh, number one hurdles or questions or fears of guys thinking about intercropping or farms thinking about intercropping is the separation aspect. So as far as questions go for separation, maybe just hold on to them. We've got the first question in the question zone. Everyone's going to talk about uh, their separation methods and how big of a pain in the ass it is, or it's not that bad or cost things associated with that. So without further ado, I'm going to get the ball rolling here tonight. Uh, start with this, the, a similar slide that we started with getting started with soil health, but same principles uh, these guys are going to talk about. So basically that's this is 96% of a plant is carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. What is that? Well, that's sunlight and water. And how do we use these minerals more efficiently? And instead of focusing on the high input 4% of a plant, let's get our soils functioning good so we can start cycling carbon, cycling oxygen, hydrogen, and uh, you know all the important functions to get our soils uh, producing healthy plants. So I'm going to touch on uh, on our farm, super easy intercrop that we use, uh, and just for another perspective from a corn intercrop standpoint, because it seems to be really popular with mixed grain cattle farms or even just cattle farms, uh, because corn is uh, uh, somewhat palatable uh, or or option for winter forage. So if you've been on our website, you've probably seen this or we promote it quite a bit as corn batch. Super, super easy um, first step in going down the intercrop path. Why? Because we can sow the corn and the batch basically together. Um, on, a, on our system, what we do is we sow the corn batch with our fertilizer uh, a day or two before, take the planter in and we sow our corn. Yeah, like I say, maybe a day after. But what's so nice about this is the vetch is somewhat glyph glyphosate tolerant. So we're able to have the same herbicides available to us as if we had a monocrop corn field. And this is kind of the magic of these two crops. Corn loves sunlight, 
um, loves room to stretch and grow and vetch being a cool season, slower establishing legume, um, it kind of grows underneath the canopy. So you can see the photo on the left where the corn is starting to take off. Well, the picture on the right, uh, the corn has created a microclimate for the hairy vetch underneath. So this has been sprayed with herbicide twice. It's clean as a whip, except for the, the hairy vetch. Um, but it's just, it, it, it is not a huge fan of direct sunlight. So that's why it works so perfectly in the system with, with corn. Hangs out in the shade so the corn can get ahead of it, cleans up wasted sunlight and starts providing nitrogen to the system. And we're gonna talk about the grazing benefits. Um, but I wanna to touch on just some observations on our farm as far as sunlight. Uh, if we're talking about a planter, and I know Nick's going to talk about sowing corn with the air seeder, we're going to have some discussions about plant population and whatnot, but what we found is sowing corn vetch north-south, because the sun can shine directly down the rows, you can see on the left how much more vetch is there, but you can also see how much more sunlight is there. So on the right, that is sown east-west, and crossways the sun has to enter, penetrate the uh, the corn canopy and get to the surface and you can see how little vetch is there because there's just not much sunlight. Uh, this was fertile, crop was fertilized regular. I don't know what was there, 120, 130 pounds of nitrogen. And uh, yeah, the vetch doesn't really offer much as far as year one nitrogen production. It's more, uh, we use it to balance uh, the cattle ration come fall when we, when we graze this blend and that residual nitrogen, we actually just take advantage of the following year. So I always get asked, can you combine this crop or how big of a headache is it to combine? 30 inch uh, rows, no problem at all. You barely notice the vetch there. Come fall, the vetch kind of hangs out low in the canopy. It, it falls back to the, the soil surface and it's not an issue at all. Again, these rows are north south. You can see very distinct clear paths for, for sunlight to penetrate that corn canopy and, and provide that microclimate for the vetch. And something we're very excited about going in the future was our 60 inch corn trials. So you can see the amount of vetch biomass that's there. And obviously cutting the corn population in half doesn't necessarily mean 50% uh, of the yield. It's probably more like 75 or 80% of the yield. So if we can get 80% of our corn yields, giving our, our corn plants to, to grow, well, look at all that sunlight we captured late in the fall. High, high, high quality biomass feed for our cattle. So if you just want to go back there, Trav, um, we're, we'll touch on it at the end. Put your questions below if you got them. But heading into next year, we're actually working on trials with uh, the university. They're going to do some testing for us of uh, triple 30 rows and then followed by a 60 inch gap. So uh, just a missing corn row followed by triple or triple 30 inch. Um, and we're hoping we can minimize uh, or minimize our corn yield losses, but kind of keep this amount of vetch biomass, just giving it strategic places for it to capture sunlight and other energy and spread throughout the canopy. And of course, the biggest advantage of, of the corn vetch is if you, if you can take it for grain, you can harvest that corn, take it out obviously as a grain crop, Try you can play that video if you want, um, take it as a grain crop, you know, if it's not spectacular, that's okay. We're asking it to cover our costs. Maybe we can make a bit on it, but the real value is what you're seeing in the video here, which is um, the amount of digestible corn biomass we have, but also we have a protein source, super high digestible vetch. How digestible is it? These cows on the left were, um, it was about two days they were out in this particular paddock with corn vetch and they had literally left corn cobs behind because they're out cleaning up super digestible, super high protein, hairy vetch. Um, so we're gonna talk about this. Nick's got a corn vetch in his presentation. Ryan's got a corn vetch in his, and I would like to talk about plant population with some of these intercrops, as far as, you know, reducing sunlight to our cash crop to feed this relay crop or the, or the intercrop and the, the trade-offs and whatnot. Um, but without further ado, uh, Nick Cowan's a good friend of mine. He was the one that actually introduced me to that corn vetch idea. And uh, it's kind of fun, Nick and I bicker now about planter versus air seeder and stuff like this, plant population. But uh, Nick's tried a lot of things on his farm, farms with his dad and his brother. Um, Nick, I'm not sure if your mic's off, but why don't you take it away? Walk us through, uh, your, tell us about your, your kids here and then walk us through some of the intercrops you've tried. <laughs> okay. uh, 
Yeah, we were just uh, booze cruising one Sunday night, and uh, we stopped at the, this is a uh, fall rye strip, and then I sold it with a shank drill, a mixed crop, and the cover crop's not too good, but I put it in there because uh, my uh, cousin Brittany Phillips and her husband Jess Williams from Delarain are thinking about getting into livestock, and I just wanted to say like four kids is no different than four cows. Like, there's no point really having one. <laughs> like one cow, one cow is a lot more work than zero cows, but four kids is about the same as one kid. So don't stop with one cow, get four. Those I have guys. zero cows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ne next photo, please. Yeah, Nick, we're on a, probably a little bit of a delay here. I was telling okay. all the guys, um, yeah, we'll, we're going to try and stick with you for slides, but also I'm going to, interject with questions as well. So if I have a question, I'm just gonna say the word question out loud, continue your thought and then we can come back to, to whatever I had to ask. So just so okay. I'm not constantly interrupting because of the delay, but have at it. This is one of my, uh, one of the crops we're gonna try on our farm this year. Okay, sounds good. Well, this, uh, this was uh, at this point of the year, this was the most excited I've ever been about a crop. Like it, uh, this is sunflowers with uh, vetch and flax. And um, this had zero fertilizer. We sprayed it with uh, um, authority. And then we came back and sprayed Roundup before pre-emerge. And then we didn't spray it with any um, chemical, like uh, any herbicide all year long, no uh, insecticide either. And it was really clean and it was um, no insect problems. It was the nicest looking crop. It was, I was hundred percent pumped, but um, Joe told me that we had to talk about one of our screw ups and this actually, it, it's, it's the first time we've done this for about four years. And it's the first time that the vetch actually the secondary crop that was just supposed to grow underneath the primary crop. If I showed you a, a picture at harvest, it did actually, it got a little bit, too aggressive and it pulled down the uh, it pulled down some sunflowers and uh was detrimental but the last three years before this year it was advantageous so nick just, so just talk, keep about that in. Your, talk about your yeah. plant population on the sunflower and uh what you sowed as far as vetch and, and flax yeah the uh sunflowers was seventeen thousand plants per acre down the tube and the sunflower or the vetch and flax was one to two pounds, but it was pretty much as slow as I could run my meter. So I hardly put any vets or flax in, and I don't know what the heck happened this year compared to other years. And the, the, I've, I, I, I don't know, but the vetch went bonkers. People always ask me like, what, like about the corn vetch, I guess, cause like we promote it quite a bit, but people always yeah. ask me what rate of vetch to go with as far as intercropping. But it's really a question of how much sunlight are you going to give it? Like, look at that. Well, That's two, two pounds of vetch versus, I mean, I've sown 15 pounds of vetch with oats and haven't seen what 10% of that result. It might not be just the, well, it might have something to do with the sunlight for sure. Maybe, maybe it all has to do with the sunlight. I, I couldn't figure out why this year it went so crazy. Well, this is a I nice thought, segue to yeah. talk about the grazing. You don't have to give us a number, but you can just talk about how many head, roughly how many days. Okay. Um, yeah. Between you, Ryan, and I, we're going to have a conversation about valuing what that fall grazing, winter grazing is worth. But just talk For about, sure. we should have had a picture from you combining, but uh, just talk about how many animals you were grazing on, on this. Okay. Um, the reason I took this one photo is because the electric, this is right at the edge of the field. And this photo is from yesterday. I just shot it and sent it to you. And uh, the electric fence goes right down, right where you can see. So that's what we would have had across the whole field. If uh, you would have looked at that, uh, like if we wouldn't have grazed it, yep. um, we split the, it's a, it was a six, it was a small section. There's two yard sites off it, but like it was 600 acres and we split it into four. And that was huge. Like that really increased the value that we got for the grazing. It extended our grazing. Like I don't, you can't really put a hard number on how much it extended the grazing, but I think the more fences you build, the more money you make, like the more it's, it's better 
So you got to weigh that with how hard you want to work because it's hard work. But like yeah. it's not as easy. It's easier just for, uh, uh, fencing the perimeter, but the cross fences definitely pay. I got it written down here. I just jotted it down that we uh, we went out there November 18th with uh, 400 cow calf pairs. And then about a week later, we put an, our bread heifers out there. There's about 100 breads. And we had them on there until January 5th. And then we took the, the everything in and um, we weaned the, the calves on January 5th. And we weighed uh, like 15 of them just to get an average. And uh, we gained 2.23 pounds per day out there on the calves. But the cows got skinny on us. Like it was hard work on the cows and uh, not all the cows. I would say uh, about, we put two, after we weaned, we put about two thirds of the cows back on and we kept a third of the cows and uh, the bread heifers in the lot for two weeks and really fed them a uh, big, big, uh, like really gave them a lot of feed and spoiled them a little bit because they were a bit on the skinny side. Then we, we put, we immediately put the good looking cattle back out on the vetch for a while. And then we moved the good looking cattle onto corn and uh, we moved the skinnier cattle after two weeks in the lot back out onto the vetch. And we give them a little bit of feed every day, not full ration, but a little bit and they pick and they eat. So that's what we got right yeah, now. You you told me yesterday, like the cows are still grazing and you have enough uh, well, forage. The, the cow, graze right for you. Yeah, the cows are grazing uh, a quarter section of open pollinated corn that we did a, like a, we were actually hoping to combine the corn and use it for seed, but it didn't really go as planned. So we're grazing it. Oh, okay. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Piola, uh, it worked out. I think really awesome for us this year. Um, we uh, used treated canola seed this year and it, uh, I, I don't, I can't, flea beetles, we talked about it last week or uh, the guys that were on talked about it. You can't really get away. I, the, 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 as much as I hate to say it, Helix works for us. Like it, it, it made a big difference this year. And uh um this this piola that we're that picture that we got there now is uh that's from last year and it, it was a good crop too but i just was showing just that we swathed it Nick, just touch on your seeding rates what you sowed for oh. canola what you sowed for what was the well variety? this this year we uh cut back on our peas we were like uh 60 to 80 pounds but the picture here that's from not this year it's from the year before and we were at a hundred and 105 pounds of peas and we stuck with three pounds of canola so we cut back our peas kept the canola the same and it was about the same yield and these gonna, are 40 i should mention these are 40 10 peas they're a forage pea yeah we got one of the questions i got here because all three of you guys are talking about peas and canola so yeah. we're going to talk about we're going to talk about specialty peas and kind of the markets that are opening up and like the opportunity growing some of these you know high biomass uh, for biomass uh, forage peas you know using canola to get them to stand up. So yeah, we'll, we'll touch on it. We'll roll on to uh, open pollinated corn. I know you said this is actually Roundup ready corn, but uh, just talk about some of your herbicide options when you're uh, yeah you know you're doing a corn intercrop. Okay, we've kind of moved away. I've tried, or we've tried three or two or three years. We've tried uh, two different open pollinated corns and we've tried a non Roundup Ready um, hybrid. And uh, there's not, it's, it, it actually kind of sucks because there's not really a good corn seed out there that's not Roundup Ready. Well, I shouldn't say that. It, we haven't, the, the, we haven't had as much success trying the non roundup ready as for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, this is, this is roundup ready corn and roundup ready beans in there. And the corn we saw at 30,000 plants per acre and the beans is more like uh, 10 pounds, 10 pounds of beans. And it's a roundup, it's a, 
uh, Roundup, uh, it's an off patent Roundup, like a Roundup resistant one from a really long heat unit where you'd never be able to grow this. We call it Wisconsin, like it's a Wisconsin bean is what we call it, a whiskey. That's our nickname for it. And like the idea and, is that that's, that, that's never going to set seed under that canopy. So it, it stays. Very it big. does. Yeah. It actually does in like September, like the, it, the very ends go to seed. But no, it, your, our goal is to, it, it grows super tall. It grows like chest high or not quite chest high, but waist high. And it, 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 yeah, it doesn't put out much seed by the time. So how, how much, I know it's a tough question to ask because every spot in the field is different, but you're getting a decent amount of protein out of, out of your, uh, like your, your soybean growth under the corn canopy. Well, well we actually, we actually silage this and, uh, there was, um, no, no different protein in the feed test than there was, than there was the year before. So it didn't give us any protein whatsoever, but it was by far the best yield we've ever had was, the, was the year that, 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 uh, that picture, the first picture, the soybean, uh, corn happened. Nice. So, Nick, do you want to touch on just, I know that's a picture of, of hairy vetch under your open pollinated corn. Some people yeah. like you know, there's lots of interest in OP corn these days for yeah. lots of lots of good reasons. You want to just talk about your herbicide program? Yeah, As well, as it's as easy. As it's actually really easy to keep um, uh, open pollinated corn clean. We sprayed this year with uh, Accent, Dicamba and Atrazine. And we actually had to make two passes like uh, five minutes. Like we pretty much sprayed the the accent and then we came back and sprayed the dicamba and atrazine right after because you can't tank mix accent and dicamba and uh the the information i got on that was uh we bought our open pollinated seed from a guy in uh like mcgregor manitoba i think cat corn it's called and he is he is unbelievably awesome on uh he really helped me out with uh do some good advice on uh different chemicals or whatever but uh yeah we can we keep our our open pollinated it, it, it's not hard to keep the weeds out open pollinated corn with the uh, the chemicals and it actually the one of the benefits about fooling around with open pollinated corn is we kind of woke up to the idea of mixing dicamba and atrazine in with our roundup for our roundup ready corn and it we I, I was, we were blown away with our weed control this year because our weeds kind of got away from us last year. So this year we really, we cut back on the vetch and soybeans in with the corn and concentrated on weed control. And, uh, we had like zero weeds. I was offering guys a hundred dollar bill if they could find a weed in our corn crop. So, <laughs> okay, but I think uh, next year, but I think next year, uh, we're going to go back to, uh, to put in the vetch and the soybeans and uh, just uh, we think it's more advantageous, especially on it, our corns going on lighter land across the river. And uh, we, we think we, we can easily put up with, we, we can put up with a few weeds for the added benefit of the nitrogen and the protein of the companion crop. Nick, just before uh, I, this is your last slide, and I know that's not your yep. picture. These are my cows grazing, but just two two points on open pollinated corn. Do you want to talk about yield difference versus Roundup Ready, if there is any, and then just talk about maybe just touch quickly just on the grazing aspect, op open pollinated corn versus Roundup Ready. Yeah, well, um, the only time we've ever grazed Roundup Ready is when we uh, sold it really late on a, like a disaster year, we sold it really late and it was, uh, it worked out really good because the corn was super light. Didn't get a, that hard shell on it. Like it was, and it, it, it didn't work great. Like we, we took one trip across the field with the combine and our hopper filled up immediately, but it was like puff wheat. I've never had any, I've never seen corn like this. So we're like, well, this is pointless to combine it. So we grazed it and it was, it worked out super well. Like if you ever have corn that doesn't make it, don't fool around trying to chop it or combine it. Just put a wire up because the cattle did, it was super tall because it was seeded late and the cob, they, they did really well on it. But 
the open pollinated corn, we kind of always go for, we the original plan is to try and keep it for seed. And then it's never really worked out for us. So we end up just grazing it and uh, they eat it. It breaks down way quicker. Like it doesn't stand up as tall as the Roundup Ready corn. I don't know if that has anything to do with the Roundup Ready or just the fact that it's a uh, like variety thing. But uh, the, the open pollinated corn, they, it, they say it's more digestible and I think it is, but they eat the Roundup Ready corn too on a graze. So I don't know. I think that's kind of a wash or not really a huge difference. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to just, just touch really quickly on, on grazing, uh, grazing your corn vetch after like your corn, corn vetch stover. Do you use a wire? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, we combine the corn and then we basically just fence the perimeter and um, we, uh, we don't put up that many cross fences, but this year we started putting up cross fences and we seen, we, we kind of seen the firsthand, the advantage of the cross fence. So we're going to have to put up cross fences now that we know how beneficial it is, but uh, the, the, yeah. it works really good because the odd, the odd cob that you miss, with your corn header or your cob drop, they, they seem to find those and they mix it in with the vetch. We don't have a ton of experience with vetch and corn. We've fooled around a couple of years of it. And uh, um, we've put alfalfa in there too. It's alfalfa, you don't get near the bang for your buck, in my opinion. Like you, a couple pounds of alfalfa in there is the exact same as a couple pounds of vetch. You can spray it with a little bit of Roundup and you're not going to hurt the vetch or the alfalfa, but the vetch is going to give you way more biomass in my opinion. And the alfalfa isn't going to give you as much biomass, but if you're scared of, you know, having a chopper or a combine problem, the alfalfa won't bother it a bit. And the vetch, it, uh, if it gets too rank, it, it could bother your harvest. Yeah. So, and that's, that that I've talked to a few silage operations, shown them pictures of what our corn batch looks like, and they have said that probably wouldn't work great. And yeah. just, to, just to touch on the point you made, Nick, about using a wire, we were the yeah. same as you. We didn't, we didn't, we never grazed uh, corn stover and vetch with a wire, but we yeah. did this year. And man, every every hour, every minute you spend out there putting up fence, the cows are going to reward you with better quality grazing, better manure distribution. Uh, yeah, it really is worth your time. And like, it's the fall, what the hell else are you doing? You know? Yeah. And the other thing about that is we kind of were thinking we just throw the cows out there and, um, and uh, graze and feed them a little bit and then move to the next field and graze and feed them a little bit. But I think we, I think the plan for next year is like that January, we're not going to leave the calves on until January 5th. We're going to try and, um wean way earlier and then we're going to run we're i hope the plan is and we've never really done it because we've been nervous to do it but we're going to start putting the breads and the calves out after they're weaned it, and uh try and uh make use of because we're going to have more grazing so our our theory was well let's not kill ourselves with cross fence we're just throwing the cows out there and we're going to make it till march anyway but now we're going to get greedy i think and throw the calves out there and try and use everything we can and make sure we get it through uh get get more out of it i was nick i was going to go down another tangent about leaving the wire up and letting the calves creep feed themselves on the veg but and we've already got a shit ton of questions coming in yep uh, so <laughs> great job. That was awesome. Um, Ryan, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, Ryan, uh, farms at Forest Manitoba. He's doing, uh, lots of different stuff, just like Nick. Um, yeah, Ryan's, uh, intercropping. He's utilizing full season, uh, cover crops on his grain lands, integrating livestock. Um, so Ryan, if you're unmuted, um, yeah, tell us about your farm. Tell us about your intercrops and, I'm going to butt in and ask questions along the way. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Joel. 
I'm kind of the, I think the Bush League intercropper on this panel here. I'm more of a cow guy. Hey, 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 hey. I think <laughs> I can take that crown. <laughs> so, yeah, we farm. We're just up north of uh, Brandon by Forest. We've got, I guess, calf, three, four hundred cows, a bunch of yearlings, um, lots of perennial pasture, but we've done uh, our share, I guess, of intercropping and different things over the years. Um so yeah, farm, uh, Connor English is our main man. He's here every day helping me and, and dad's still around a bit, getting some work out of him this winter. He's home. Um, but yeah, we're running like a zero. Hey, Ryan, can I, Ryan, can I interrupt you? Connor English, I know you're on this chat. Can you put your mailing address uh, in the chat? You won a hat last time and we don't know where to send it. Sorry, keep going, Ryan. <laughs> got to keep your hired man happy. Oh yeah, you got to keep him happy. He's a good man, so... <laughs> but uh, I think uh, probably we're starting with this winter wheat, pea, and vetch mix. This is, uh, I think, by far the best home run in the intercrop world that, that, that we have hit here. It's something that uh, I get, I don't know, we just kind of stumbled onto it. Like years ago, we planted some winter triticale with, uh, with the vetch after being down at Gabe's place in North Dakota there and, and, seeing what they were doing with that triticale it looked interesting and we we did that it kind of worked it, it kind of didn't had a hard time finding somebody to clean it so kind of sat on that for a while and then we decided to plant it with some winter wheat a couple of years later and uh it was the first year we had the disc drill so we were just learning how to use that thing went out into some uh pretty heavy spring wheat uh stubble planted the winter wheat and the vetch hairpin like crazy it it didn't get a real perfect stand it, it didn't look like much but the next spring we went out real early planted some uh yellow peas into it just kind of to fill in the the blanks where the the stubble was heavy and the wheat and the vetch didn't establish and i wasn't sure what it was going to look like and it it but it came everything seemed to take off and start growing um i think like it turned kind of white with the peas first or the winter first you'd see the wheat and then it and then it looked like it was peas and then a little while later it just turned purple and uh went out there with the combine thought we were gonna stripper header it but that didn't work the vetch started to wrap um but yeah we we put the flex header on went into it and harvested and it actually turned out all right we didn't use any fertilizer it yielded i think about 40 50 bushel an acre of bulk and, so Ryan, uh, sorry, let me stop you. Just break down your seeding rates. Um, yeah. Why the vetch is in there, why the peas are in there. And like, I, I mean, I, I, I buy this stuff every day. So I'm like, your cross return is going to be ridiculous. Just talk about the opportunity with this crop. Yeah, so that's where I guess we didn't really realize what we had there. So we were trying to grow vetch seed was basically what we were after. Um, and so we didn't put any fertilizer in. So the vetch and the and the peas were kind of working to fix the nitrogen. And the winter wheat is just kind of along for the ride. It, it the winter wheat just allows us to grow the vetch. Like I would, I've we've had vetch on its own before. It's really, you know, if you think 40, 10 forage peas are well, fun I, to harvest, try to combine some straight vetch. It's not gonna work. So the winter wheat just kind of holds it up. And when I say up, it's like three inches off the ground instead of one. And, and yeah, I think we got maybe, it was probably like, I don't know, 20, 20, half and half wheat and peas, a little more wheat than peas. And then a fraction of, of vetch. So like we were looking at three, 400 pounds an acre of vetch plus like that 40 bushels of the other stuff. So when you, you add that all up, it actually is a pretty tidy um, so, so I'm, a, I'm, a con, I'm a conventional farmer that thinks that looks like a bloody mess and 60 bushel canola looks great. Talk about why <laughs> that is actually the future than 60 bushel canola. Well, yeah, like you look at uh, like what is, uh, I think if you're trying to buy vetch right now from the, from the. I'm, I'm, I'm literally here. trying to buy vetch from you right now. I know you are. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm off selling it right now. So like. Most guys, what are they charging? Three fifty a pound. You're going to sell it for three and give everybody a deal, right? Yeah. So oh, yeah. I mean, oh, if you yeah. look at that, uh, um, you know, four hundred pounds of vetch at let's use two dollars a pound. You know, sure. numbers add up pretty quick. 
Yeah, and 800, uh, 800 bucks, a $800 an acre byproduct sounds okay. I'd say, yeah. So, um, and this is not something, it wasn't a one-off. We actually, the next year we let that field volunteer. There was enough veg coming that, because it, it shells out a little bit. It, it, oh, as yeah. you're waiting on the bulk of the seeds to mature, the early stuff is shelling out. So we just left that. I seeded, uh, well, it basically just volunteered wheat and veg again, like really made the neighbors do a head turn as they're driving by <laughs> like that because it was even thinner looking until it fills in later in the fall and we did it again we got like 300 pounds of vetch off that same field um so and just just for everyone that's about to rush out and plant half the farm to winter wheat and vetch i've tried growing fall rye vetch uh winter wheat vetch uh seven times and have produced zero viable vetch seed so yeah. it's like Ryan's good at it. He's got a skill. <laughs> like it, it does take some fine tuning, tuning, and you have to be okay with it not working seven times in a row. No, because you do. And I think that's next where next year's my year, man. Next year's the year. Yeah, it's the year. But I think part of it is like this is eighty <laughs> acres at a time, right? Like I, yeah, I, exactly. If you tried to do more than that, because timing is so critical. So we're sitting there with the old red twister, basically when it's when it's time to go, we go out there and get it off. Whereas like if you were sitting bearing down on a half section or, or a section or more, you know, there's a good chance you'll miss it. Like we have, we thought we were going to harvest some vetch two years ago when it was so wet in 19 fall and, and it just didn't happen. It was only a 50 acre field that it didn't have the wheat or anything with it. It was more straight vetch, but, but yeah, so it, it's not for the faint of heart. But I think the lesson learned here is uh, like most people don't like the, the big hang up with vetch and, and any cereal is cleaning it. But if you can figure out a way to clean it, I mean, there's there's opportunity here to grow that stuff. And I think common mistake would be to sow too heavy a vetch rate. Like you really don't need many plants. Like I, I think, like I say, we got we got that 300 pounds or more off of volunteers. Like I think two, three pounds an acre would be sufficient. We're sowing six to eight maybe in this wheat blend and anywhere from you know 80 to 100 pounds of wheat so it hey, uh Ryan, we're sorry we're already getting questions rolling in let's yeah. uh we'll, we're going to come back Keep to this one. i think i think lots of people are interested for good reason um yeah. talk about talk about your corn soybeans batch yeah so this is i don't think we need to talk much about the corn this is grazing this mixture here same thing as Nick, we try and buy the most expensive, fanciest uh, soybean seed to mix with that corn. And uh, it, it just yields great, the cows, cows love it. I have a love-hate relationship with the corn grazing. I feel like on one hand, we, we wanna be forage only, not grazing mature corn cobs, but on the other hand, it's super cheap feed for the cows and it yeah. keeps them out on the field all winter long. It, it works good. So, so that one, uh, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Just Brian, I'll, I'll ask you this. I'll ask you this question, and then I'm going to bring it up again at the end. Hopefully, we have time for other people's questions other than my own. Yeah, but like, what are you seeding as far as plant population on the corn here? And uh, I'm I'm going to push everyone on the call to to think about this, talking about uh, lowering our plant population because really, when we're grazing animals, corn is not the most ideal or digestive. Uh, plant that we want growing in the fields. Uh, in my mind, like it's used as a trellis and to shade those high protein, super digestible legumes that we can establish underneath. So just tell us about your plant population. Think about that question and we're going to touch on it at the end. Yeah. Yeah. So in this case here, it, it was a 30,000 population of, of corn. And I think I put 20 pounds of, of beans and it, it would have had a few pounds of vetch in the mix there too so yeah i i see your point then, with keeping the, the rate down on the corn to let the other stuff grow um yeah yeah our our, our experience thus far i know i said i talked about it at the end but it, it's i think about this a lot where it's like when we grow a corn vetch field corn is the byproduct of that system I mean, if it can grow high carbon biomass and shade the vetch so we can produce, you know, get a year where we get a decent amount of rain. I mean, it, that is the value is in the, the, the grazing and that we're cycling that manure right back on that land. 
And the byproduct is, yeah, we get a cornfield. So whether that's 80 bushel corn or maybe we get a hundred bushel corn, it's like, that's just there to pay the expenses. Really the money being made and the soil improvements being made is from, you know, growing that vetch biomass and balancing this C to N ratio, feeding that soil biology and keeping this a stable soil. Totally hundred percent. And I mean, even corn on its own is a great rotational crop. When you throw these legumes in there with it, like the soil following the, the corn grazing is, it's phenomenal. It's different. It just one season, it can make a huge, huge difference. So we'll keep moving on there and we'll, we'll, uh, sorry. And, uh, I just got a prequel this. Yeah. Flip up the next one too, Trev. Uh, yeah, Nick, that's your picture too. So you guys both had one picture of fava beans and flax. I got some questions. So Nick, you can unmute yourself and, uh, Ryan, Tell us about yours and Nick hop in if you like. And I got questions for both you guys. Yeah. So when I said I'm the Bush League intercropper on this panel, I think those pictures tell the tale. Nick's is probably like a decent crop of flax. Mine, um, we planted the flax and the fabas together. Had a perfect stand coming up. It looked beautiful. But then I got uh, gun shy. I had a, a few uh, little thistles coming in it. And... Uh, I didn't want to leave that unchecked and make sure I got the flax. So when we sprayed it, it really set those favas back and it turned out um, to be a bit of a flop because the fava beans caused this grief at harvest. We had to really wait. We were lucky we had the fall we did to get them to allow us to harvest it. And now I'm sitting on um, little flat fava bean chips in my flax that are, that are a bit of an issue, but. Ryan, talk I, about your, talk about your seeding rates, um, what you sowed, and your herbicide yeah. and then we'll kick it over to you nick and you can you guys can chat away yeah so it was i think we had 65 pounds of flax which is pretty heavy but i with that disc drill i still i'm still not figuring we're doing a bit of hairpinning we're not getting every seed to grow as much as it should so i tend to seed heavy and then the fava beans it wasn't a low rate of fava beans either it was 60 pounds of fava beans we just did a burn off i can't remember it might have had a little bit of heat in the burn off with Roundup, and then it was Bactril M and Centurion or uh, Clethodim for the for the in crop. Nick, do you want to tell us what was in yours? Yeah, our seeding rate was uh, 65 pounds on the flax, but we cut the fava beans back to about 40 pounds because uh, they don't flow very good through your through your manifolds and stuff like that. So the less you can seed, the better. Um, this field was kind of an afterthought. Our whole plan the whole time was to sow a half section of straight fabas. And uh, it was like, oh, I don't know, about May 25th. And uh, my dad took the sprayer out there and on like the highest part of the field and tried to do a little loop and almost got like it was the wettest half section. We couldn't believe how long it took for us to get on it. And it was kind of a last minute thing. We said, oh, let's throw do a quarter section of fabas and switch a quarter section up and do flax and um the fabas were we we sprayed with uh roundup and authority and we mixed them and we don't really like to do that we think we get way better usage out of our authority if we time it and spray it in authority weather and uh make another trip back if we're going to spray roundup right before pre-emerge we think the two trips on authority and uh, roundup if you if you if you can if the weather suits you like you can and but this this time the we were last minute we just tank mixed them sprayed it and uh we we uh came back with a sure two i believe in crop and it was uh phenomenal weed control like i was pumped about the weed control zero fertilizer 30 bushel flax and the fabas we the fabas we pretty much just took as dockage to the feedlot and fed and fed them to our backgrounders so but the in my opinion the fabas for the nitrogen like even if you don't collect the fabas if you just clean the fabas out they're still a nitrogen source i remember i was we were at uh, Derek Axon's field day i actually think ryan i, I think we had lunch together that day but he said the same thing where it's like, if the fabas don't amount to anything, at least they provided like part of the mycorrhizal network for the flax and then provide nitrogen um, yeah. for that system. So just you guys, if that worked out perfectly, you'd have 
flax and fava beans and I'm going to put my conventional mindset hat on and be like, that is going to be a nightmare to set the combine. Um, I know neither of you had fava beans to take to the elevator, but I'm assuming that was the plan off the hop. Like any suggestion as far as combine settings, I'm having a hard time figuring out how that's how that works. Maybe Nick, you go first then Ryan. Okay. Yeah, we just set them for flocks. We'll concentrate it on the flocks. Fabas were, we didn't care if we got the Fabas. That's how we did it. That was the same way at our place. We just set it for the flocks. And it, I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't, not sure I have any good advice on that. Cause it, our issue here was the, the Fabas were still green. Um, Cause we set them back so bad with the, the herbicide. So it was a challenge getting the getting it dry enough to harvest. So the fa the fabas were green and tough, um, hanging out with the flax, which was a little bit scary. But but yeah, we just set. Hey, the well, sorry guys, hopefully we got time. We can answer these faba uh, flax questions. But Ryan, sorry, we, sorry about the interruption. We'll get rolling with uh, yeah. a couple more intercrops you got going on. Yeah. So this one here, I had to put that in for, for you guys, Joe, Joe and Co. there. Thank um, you. Hey, just stop. <laughs> uh, one day we're going to talk about grazing full season cover crops because after about seven or eight beer at our field day here, we had a really, what I think was an interesting conversation about above ground biomass and what to leave, what to take. And we get that question all the time. So sometime we're going to come on and we're going to go head to head, man. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll leave that for another day. But uh, sure. I think this picture just shows the potential of these full season covers. Like that's a that's no fertilizer, nothing but seed. It um, it can grow if the conditions are right. So, and this is I think where probably some of the biggest potential is in our environment for simplifying the intercropping is doing some kind of relay crop. Like we've done a couple different trials over the last few years here. What, what we're looking at in this picture on the left, there's oats on the right is spring wheat. And then further over to the right, it was winter wheat. We just did it on 15 inch centers and then went in and, and drilled in between the rows. Uh, we did, we had some soybeans for the trial uh, and then some different brassicas, like a really crop blend. But um, I think that has potential. We did it again, two years ago with oats, just straight oats. And then uh, the relay crop blend in, in between. And uh, I think if a guy had the time and patience to get his machinery dialed in, there's, there's good potential there. It's kind of the same principle as that corn on your wide spacing. We're not giving up much yield, but getting something growing. Something I'd really like to try is doing a strip till into a perennial pasture that's been kind of intentionally overgrazed trying to establish something uh maybe potentially an organic crop into that pasture but it all comes down to moisture you got to have late season moisture to to finish this one off so just one that uh is kind of an experiment but interesting to talk about and then the old standard the pea canola like i can still remember i don't know it would be in early 2000s at university rennie van acker and and uh Gary Martin's talking about this guy in Saskatchewan, old Colin Rosengren doing his pea canola. And uh, yeah, I'd say, I mean, that's obviously the easiest, easiest place to start with, uh, with an intercrop. It's easy to separate, easy to grow. You got herbicide options. We typically just grow the peas, use the canola as moral support, I say, to help hold them up. Um, so we, so Ryan, are you, grow, are you growing yellow peas or specialty peas? We're this come picture back right here, this is yellow peas. We've been, we've switched over to 40 tens the last couple of years just because of the market, but uh, yeah, either or. Yeah, yeah we're, uh, yeah, like I, we're probably going to have a peak canola discussion just because all three of you guys are talking about it. I grow it. I think it's the easiest intercrop we can implement. Like you say, we got herbicide options. We got, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's virtually the exact same crop as growing peas or clear field canola. Oh, sorry, my dog sees your dog. Now we're gonna have a bark off. <laughs> we better change that picture. All right, that's the end of your presentation. Alex, <laughs> Alex you got any pictures of dogs in your presentation? Because mine's in here now. <laughs> we'll be good. Okay, uh, Alex Borsch, Alex was on last week uh, talking about getting started with soil health. 
obviously Alex does lots of intercropping. Kind of the new unique thing about Alex is um, they don't have cattle, so they're just doing it from a uh, either a uh, oh over yielding aspect or a relay for soil health aspect. And I know Alex, we've had conversations uh, you and me about uh, intercropping livestock and and maybe getting neighbors animals or or getting your own. So. Um, tell us about your farm and uh, these intercrops, and uh, I'm going to butt in lots, Alex, so just be prepared. All right. Well, we farm in the middle of the Red River Valley. Uh, we have about a third of our farm in organic and two-thirds in conventional. And, uh, yeah, and both of them are trying to do different regenerative practices without getting to the animal part yet. Um but basically doing different relay crops, like you can see in the back of this picture, some of those fields actually getting pretty green again after some other earlier crops. Um, and yeah, doing a lot of different intercropping and cover cropping things. So Alex, just talk about this year, peak canola, just talk about the rates you use, maybe at this point, touch on the different varieties of peas you guys grow and, and why that is. All right, so we've kind of, stuck to around three pounds of canola and 120 pounds of peas. Um, I would probably go a little bit lower on the peas on different varieties, but we grow a specialty maple pea. We don't even know what variety it is because it's kind of uh, came through the back door with a Japanese company. And um, basically it, this, this maple pea grows really tall, even taller than a forage pea. Like some of the vines were seven feet tall this year when we were growing it. And, uh, it, but it doesn't make a lot of those uh, little uh, like um, small stringy filaments that kind of hang on to the canola. So we need a higher rate for it to hold each other up. And it's used for sprouting. Um, so we need really good germ. Uh, so uh, we kind of want it to just be make one straight stem up and have pretty even maturity. Um, yeah, this works out really well. Weed control wise, it's only basically we don't even do it pre-emerge. We just do one pass of Odyssey in crop and it stays extremely clean because the canola is just so competitive wherever there's no peas or uh, there's a little bit of room, those huge cabbage leaves just take over and it it's just a blanket. So it works really well. Um, and basically for harvest, it it would be this year, I don't have a picture in here of it now, but without this year, we didn't have the canola survive because we had about a five inch rainstorm um, after about 12 inches of rain last fall. Um, right before freeze up, we had a five inch rainstorm on the Piola and it just wiped out the canola. And then the flea beetles did the rest. And so our peas were literally half an inch off the ground we had to buy special lifters to get them off so that's the difference um right there but it allows us to do a high value crop like uh that japanese company that came to visit us and when they saw what we were doing because all of their production was in oregon before and when they saw what we were doing they basically do all of their production contracts now in western canada where you have to do an intercrop they won't even let you do it as a monocrop anymore because of the risk of dirt tag and things like that. And they just like the environmental story and they pay a big premium to every other type of pea. So, Alex, maybe just talk about the, like the, the improvement or less of a need of fungicide when the peas are standing up versus laying flat as a pancake. Like, yeah. You, know, you guys don't really use fungicides anymore. It's more micros, but just like, What's going on when yeah, you put canolas and, canola and peas together? Well, I, th I think, uh, yeah, part of it is the standability, but I think the diversity just helps for diseases in general. And then it's actually kind of interesting because we've also noticed on some fields, it's not always like this. So I think it kind of depends on the germination timing, but it also helps against flea beetles in some cases. Um, when they germinate fairly similar timing wise uh we've had fields where we had canola right beside it and there's a ton of flea beetles in the canola and there was almost none in the piola and disease wise yeah um it's definitely better why i'm not sure other than that you don't have that soil contact constantly on the stem yeah but, and that yeah, just no, I, I, constantly wet underneath i think if 
air movement can move through the canopy and dry everything out instead of being a tangled mess on the soil surface. Like yeah. that's just prime conditions for a fungal disease to enter, right? For sure. Like, and that's that's true with the cereal or legume or anything. If it's a tangled mess on the soil, it's pretty high susceptible to fungal pathogens. I think probably more um, compromised immune system than than conditions where it's like no plant was meant to be laying on the soil surface. For so, sure. Yeah, we're gonna touch again. Hopefully, we get time for questions on on Piola. But I think the guys did a really good job offering three different management uh, ways. We can talk about specialty uh, peas as well. But uh, yeah, thanks guys for giving. Like that's a that's a getting started with with soil health in our crop for sure. Yeah, and I guess one last thing on the peel I was gonna say is like yield wise, if I was penciling it in. If you're doing yellow peas and canola, at least in our area, I'd say you could easily pencil in 10 pounds of canola and 40 to 50 bushels of peas. Because even on the specialty peas, we've been getting up to 40 bushels or 42 bushels an acre. And those are a way lower yield potential pea than yellow peas. So you're not giving up a ton of yield and uh, uh, it's super easy to separate. I guess, and I, I guess I'm, I might, uh, Piola grower myself this year we did uh, Clearfield canola two pounds and 60 pounds of 4010 forage peas and like we're gonna we're gonna gross in the $700 range and we cut our expenses down so that's just where like a nice take advantage of a specialty pea market where monocrop that probably wouldn't exist like literally 4010 forage peas if you know anything about them uh, uh, they grow eight feet tall until they're three inches tall so like you can actually out yield the peas, um, you know, intercropped versus monocropped just by having something, having it there, standing it up. So it's not laying flat on the ground. 100%. So, um, sorry, go after, go after lentils, flax, Alex. <laughs> yeah. So same, same concept here with the, it's actually a similar seeding rate to the Piola. We're actually using three pounds of flax because we don't want more flax because otherwise it becomes a combining nightmare. And we, and the reason why we put the flax into the lentils was because there's so many different things about chickpeas and flax in terms of helping for disease control. And so we thought, well, we used to grow lentils here in the eighties, but diseases were a problem. So why wouldn't it be the same with lentils? And, uh, we were really glad that we only seeded three pounds of flax because three pounds of flax still equaled about 20% uh, of the total yield of that crop because it branched out so much. And, um, and it yielded about 28 bushels an acre total um, if we're using lentil bushels, and, which is pretty good for black lentils. The only problem is, is that you have to combine a little bit more aggressively. Like we set the combines usually for piola and for lentils and flax, the way we would set, basically we would set everything for the bigger seeded crop. So the peas or the lentils, and then set the air for the small seeded crop. Right. And you get a pretty clean sample, but the only problem with flax is it's harder to thrash out. And then you end up chipping some of the lentils. So if we were to do it again, we would probably do it with red lentils because you can sell a number two red lentil, but a number two black lentil, especially when restaurants are all closed, are really hard to sell. So we've been sitting, like we have no market for this right now. But, um, and herbicide wise, um, it's the same as well as Piola, like just use Odyssey or Solo. And it keeps the field really clean. Um, the one thing that we have noticed is that if you add a liter of, let's say, alpine and fulvic acid with that herbicide, it really cuts down on that yellow flashing on some of those legumes. Like it probably cuts it down by 50%. So it's only like one or two days where you can really see those crops slow down and they pick right back up again. Whereas sometimes we've seen it on the peas without it where it's just been the Odyssey, it's cut them back for like a week or five days of really slowing them down. And I think that helps line up the maturities a bit better too. Um, we had to reglone this. So there was the odd bit of green flax in it, but you basically just throw it out the back of the combine and it's not a big deal. 
How about yeah. balls, Alex? Sorry, just quickly. How about ball balls of flax in the sample? Yeah, it's actually not that bad. Like that's a pretty representative picture right there. Um, of what you can see, I think you actually end up put put like basically blowing most of them out the back the balls. So you get some regrowth then of some flax. Like basically, you get a free cover crop of flax afterwards, and you still end up with let's say like six or seven bushels of flax in that. Yeah. So it's kind um, of a mix that way. Yeah. The best cover crop of all. The most mycorrhizal dependent. Uh, you know what? Sorry, keep going. I don't need to. We're at an hour right now. And we got a shit ton of questions. No. So I should keep focus. <laughs> so here's Austrian winter peas and oats. We seeded this at a bushel and a half of oats, which is probably a little bit heavy. Um, but we this is in an organic setting. So we wanted to have good weed control. And then we did it with Austrian winter peas because uh, we thought the smaller seed size would match up good for cleaning it out. And uh, and also we wanted it for cover crops. Um, this worked out unreal. Uh, we did this side by side with uh, yellow peas and oats. And this we plowed down the yellow peas and oats as a green manure crop. But it looked like the oats was way yellower. And they're both coming behind wheat. So I think that the Austrian winter peas are way better at sharing nitrogen with the oats. And um, yeah, out of this mix, no fertilizer, a little bit of liquid fish and humic and stuff like that. But um, it went about 100 bushels of oats and 10 to 15 bushels of peas. And Give us an idea, great, Alex, great in an organic peas. system, what that's worth as far as grass so that'd be like seven and a quarter for the oats and well there's no organic market for the austrian winter peas but the austrian winter peas we were selling them once we cleaned them for about 15 bucks a bushel Woo. yeah so very nice so, uh, for sure in and in a conventional setting i think you could do even better so yeah. um yeah and if you wanted to push more peas i think it's i would wouldn't be scared to drop that oat rate to three quarters of a bushel or something like that if you just want it there as a trellis and it holds up peas even way better than canola does yeah my, my my biggest aha moment with intercropping was um back like back during my conventional mindset days when we used to sow down a hay field we would take instead of sowing 90 pounds of oats we'd sow 30 pounds of oats and those fields would look indistinguishable from, from one to the next. Uh, and uh, the, there's a researcher that I'm friends with. He said the same thing where it's like three bushels of oats per acre versus one bushel yields you generally no difference, but it's yeah. like a sunlight difference. So we can incorporate like a low light legume like Alex has done here and actually get the benefit of both worlds where it's like, yeah, just give the oats a bit of room to stretch their wings. They're going to end up fine. But in the meantime, it gives some sunlight to those peas to establish themselves. And, and we can um, oh, uh, set the growing times, just set waves in the growing times. And uh, when different plants need different minerals at different times, of course. And, and that's what we're talking about with taking advantage of, of intercropping. 100%. It's unreal how big the flag leaf gets on oats when it's intercrop. Yeah. And yeah well, I'm, eating rate. I, and I think that's as much a competition issue or not issue, but a, a competition metric than anything where it's like, we just gave the oak plant the ability to express itself naturally, which is not with competition in row one centimeter away, you know? Yeah. And there's actually a lot of, and, and that breaks, sorry, I was just going to say that breaks into other questions like uh, competition and weed control and stuff like that. But sorry, Alex, we got like a shit ton of questions for you too. So no, let's no, roll no, on. You got a You got a soybeans canola and I got a ton of questions. Oh, there Man, the delay is uh, bad. <laughs> yeah. The uh, soyola was kind of an accidental intercrop that we did this year. So we we're going to do non-GMO soybeans. And then we got that giant rainstorm I was talking about. And those soybeans were trying to get through about an inch and a half thick crust. Um, yeah, it, it looked like a disaster. They were all kinking over and growing back down and dying. And so we decided to go in there and just, uh, seed canola into it. And, uh, as soon as the canola started germinating, some of that, those soybeans started to pop back up through. So it was about a half, half a population of, of soybeans in there. And we're like, well, 
what if we just leave the two of them and grow together and we just spray for grasses? Because that's Liberty pod chatter canola with a non-GMO, so clear field soybean. So it doesn't really line up the herbicides that well. But um, yeah, and it was seeded probably about three weeks later, the canola, than the beans were, or two weeks. So we're like, even though it's a really late season bean for our area, we like, oh, it could probably work out. Um, we got a really early frost, which locked in a lot of greens, which kind of screwed up the soybeans a bit, but it yielded. So all of our canola was reseeded and we averaged just around 50 bushels and that was seeded all in June. But, uh, this did about the same total. I haven't separated it yet, but just basically displaced some of the canola with, with soybeans. But, uh, Less I think, inputs though as well. Well, not really, because we actually fertilized the canola, oh, the canola. The mineral bander. We put 90 pounds in, which is probably a lot less than most people would with canola. But uh, it's still, yeah, the soybeans, I have pictures, they still did nodulated really well. So, yeah. and they're really pink on the inside of those nodules. So it was still working. But if I was to do it again, I would probably put something like ESN with it and i would seed the canola i would seed basically like uh well liberty there's not many liberty soybeans but uh well, i can't remember what it's called there's some of them that are roundup and liberty and yeah. uh i would see like an earlier maturing one and i would seed the canola into it probably like let's say right after it's emerging and i think you could probably cut it down to like 30 or 40 pounds in and i think you could get some really good results with this intercrop it's really nice for harvesting. Alex, you did, Alex, did, you, did you do? Yeah, did you do uh, uh, melted nitrogen on this or melted urea? Um, no, we did not. If we would have not put that N up front, we would definitely have done the melted nitrogen instead. I was gonna. Say, I was gonna say it seems like a like a nice system where uh, melted urea or. Uh, foliar nitrogen would fit really well. it would have been it would have been awesome and that's probably how we would have done it if we had done it intentionally but we thought those soybeans were done they looked like they were all yellow and curling under so we thought they were dead for sure so that's how i would do it if i would do yeah i'd probably do that if i were to do it again but the beauty of it is that you don't have to worry about either crop shelling out yeah for sure the, yeah, what a, what a that, massive advantage that is because that's the thing with the peas and oats, you have to get a pretty early pea or oat and a pretty late pea or canola, same thing. Like you always have to watch out for that. So, yeah. Okay. Sorry. We got questions rolling in here. We're going to keep rolling. Alex, you get a couple slides up to go. And then uh, yeah. I, I keep adding questions to my sheet. So like, this is going to, we got a long night. <laughs> um, but yeah, I want to talk yeah. about relay relay as well. Um, Nick, or sorry, yeah, these are both the same. Nick, Ryan, just take note of this. I want to talk about uh, uh, incorporating relay crops into uh, cash conventional systems and like some of the benefits. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so this was just Clearfield canola underseeded with alfalfa, not for the purpose of making a hay crop, but just having basically a cover crop, something green grown into the fall and then seeding oats straight into it the next year and just basically trying to keep the alfalfa alive, but basically always hitting it back with herbicides going forward. But uh, we basically just matched the canola seeding rate with our alfalfa. So we did five pounds of each and we put it uh, basically just bag for bag into the seeder and it mixed perfectly. And next year we're actually gonna cut the rate back to four pounds of each because we found that the alfalfa helped the canola germinate because it pushed up the crust um, and together. And so we actually had way better germination on the canola when we had the alfalfa with it than when we didn't. And the, the alfalfa, the only bad part about it was is that I think it kept the straw greener for longer. So it was a little bit tougher to put through the combine um like we definitely needed more horsepower to combine this but i don't think we were losing any canola but it uh yeah it worked out really well um like at the end of the season when those leaves were starting to drop all of a sudden that alfalfa popped right through through the top and we had roots like we dug down almost 20 inches and we couldn't get to the bottom of the alfalfa roots 
and they went right through some of the hard pads and some spots and everything. So I think this uh, kind of idea on the relay cropping side has a lot of promise for all of, cause it's so hard to establish annual fall season, like late season cover crops. Like I think this is a way easier, better way to get into cover crops. I agree. Um, yeah, Same so idea, this, I know. this was a relay of uh, red clover into fall rye stubble It's just harrowed in with a weeding harrow. This is on the organic side and uh, yeah, it just turned out pretty nice. Uh, it's another way of, for, I guess, some of the grain guys to just get a little bit of growth in the fall. I would say it's really hit and miss with the clovers getting harrowed in. It depends on your moisture, especially in July um if they make it or not and if you have a ton of grasshoppers or not but it can actually make for some pretty nice biomass especially uh the next spring yeah um well great presentation alex um now to question period sadly we have to get to joe's questions before everyone else gets questions answered but i think it's really important we talk on the separating aspect of it so Alex, this is a picture of, uh, of your, uh, or one of the separation methods you use, but um, maybe we'll start with that. We'll go in reverse order. We'll go Alex, Ryan, and then Nick. Just talk about the intercrops you grow as far as where they end up in the combine hopper together and that we have to separate. Do you do it off the combine? Do you, do you know, wait to do it till you have uh, time in the, in the winter? or and just the method because i know that's it's honestly you guys you guys know this it's the biggest hurdle or one of the biggest hurdles with getting into it is just like the unknown of how much time is it going to slow down the combine can i store it together how does it separate what are splits so i, I like maybe we'll try we got a shit ton of questions you guys so maybe we'll just try and keep it to like if you can talk in three to five minutes alex and then ryan and then nick just talk about your separation process yeah, so for any of the big slash small seeded intercrops, so like flax, lentils, pea, uh, peas and canola, things like that, or soybeans and canola, we're, we've been putting them in a bin first and separating them later, although we might change that in the future. But we find that the oil seeds actually really buffer the peas from getting crack, splits and cracks uh, when we're augering it. So we actually kind of like putting them together into the bin and we haven't had any issues with moisture or anything like that. Um, and cleaning them is super easy. It goes really fast. Um, I don't know. We're probably doing a truckload an hour or something like that on the pe like in terms of Piola. Um, yeah, super easy. Just got to get the right screen sizes and it pretty, uh, I would just watch out. I'd, don't particularly like the quick clean if you're going for any higher quality peas for higher germ because it's a little bit rougher on the peas. I would use the Farm King rotary screen and that's kind of what we've switched to. But uh, yeah, it's it's really quite easy to separate. Uh, anything more complicated than that, we've gone to an actual cleaner and spend like 40 to 60 cents a bushel to get it clean, like on pea oats because there's a lot of buyers that are really picky about those pea splits. And that's kind of an issue overall with intercropping is sometimes the marketing. Uh, when you do have that, you really have to pay attention who you're selling to and how open they are to, to some of those, those basically some of that dockage from an allergen perspective and from just like the compatibility. Cool. Ryan, do you want to uh, talk about your separation process? Uh, you bet. So we've, um, we've tried the, the rotary screener, like the farm King style. Uh, it worked decent for the peak and all. I mean, it, it's all you need. We've used a quick clean for that peak and all as well. When, uh, there was enough canola in the P P Ola mix, the quick clean was having trouble, um, separating it quick enough. I don't know if I wasn't doing it right or whatever, but, um, yeah, and then like we're kind of like Alex, if we'll take it, take stuff to the to a professional, like somebody with a seed plant, let it, let them clean it. We've tried to use one of those wind machines, uh, or I don't know what you'd call them, like the density separator, um, and it on the vetch wheat mix, and it, I, I, 
lost patience with that. So we had to end up taking it to a, to a cleaner to get it clean properly. Um, but yeah, we lately, the last few years, the peak canola, it's more been just peas, the little bit of canola. I haven't bothered cleaning it out. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of our experience. We, we definitely need to up our cleaning game and it's always been in the back of my mind, setting some kind of cleaning system up a little more permanent. Um, but trying to balance the acres and the, the, the capital cost investment. So it, it makes more sense to get custom guys to do most of our cleaning. Nick, you're going to custom clean mine. <laughs> yeah, we got a, we got a pretty sophisticated uh, seed plant, but I'm actually not the start. What do you, what tool do you use to start that thing? Which, which thing? What are you talking about? Your seed cleaner. Isn't it a golf tee? <laughs> well yeah well did you get more sophisticated you weren't supposed to bring that up <laughs> yeah we got a few contactors that need replaced but it's pretty fancy equipment it does a really nice job i i'm not real technical the like my father and my brother are kind of the guys who do the seed cleaning so then the spraying like they do the hard work and i just have to talk on the webinars so <laughs> Um, well, I'm glad you're here. We're gonna build yeah. on the next one. <laughs> but they no, we uh, it's it's. I don't know. It's not that easy. Like you got to work at it. I'd say it's not. Um, I like combining the corn and letting the cows eat the rest, and then you don't have to separate it. But it's uh, you definitely want to make some extra money, grow some high value crops, cut your inputs, and because it is, it's work cleaning. It's not free. Yeah, and I think that's probably the the point to hit home on, like that all the guys have touched on, and I can back this up too, where it's like currently um, from a commodities perspective, our products are not being valued at more. So it's like if we can intercrop these things and and take these high value crops that are otherwise a bitch to grow monocrop, incorporate them in an, in an intercrop scenario, it, it just may, it's a win win, right? Um, and I guess, I, I guess I'll touch on mine, you guys, for separating. We use a quick clean, and it is hard on pea seeds, and especially when you're putting through high-value um, pea crops. It's, there's definitely some cracking, but it, as far as speed, there's almost nothing that can touch it. Like, we can do at, right off the combine, separate it into two different bins. Uh, really nice, but, of course, all of our stuff is being used for seed and, like, every crack means that's a wasted product right so uh okay before just we get into questions my one last question i warned each of you we were going to do these um because the critics will say hey joe i've driven past your inner crops and they don't look that good some of them so i want each of you to to uh apply some humility here and ryan we'll start with you and then nick and then alex Talk about an intercrop. You, you, the concept was sound, but didn't work out. <laughs> um, well, I could go on all night, so we're tight. I hear time. you. So could I. Just <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've had lots of issues with the intercrop where we didn't plan our, our herbicide program, like the weed control, far enough in advance, and you plant something in a mixture – and you might even establish it nicely, but there's enough weeds that it, you have to pull the pin. But I guess the one that's fresh in my mind is this flax faba deal. I'm sitting on flax. It's got like 18% faba chips in it. That uh, It's not that big of a deal, but it was, it was damn close to us not being able to harvest it because it was so green and mushy. Like we couldn't, we couldn't hardly get it into the bin without you know, it's blowing up because uh, it was so wet. But so that's probably, yeah, I don't know. There's lots of different instances. The first kick of the can of the peak and all I, I flopped out, but uh, um, yeah, I've figured it out. Keep tweaking, keep going. Nick. Yeah. We've never really got anything to grow in with our cereals. Like you were talking, Joe, on your oats vets. Like we've tried, um, uh, different legumes to grow with our wheat and it just have we've had zero success I don't know if the wheat's too competitive or whatever 
uh, that flax and vetch, don't let your second crop. That was, uh, I, I don't know if that was a success or a failure, depending on, uh, how you like, uh, it, it was probably a failure because, uh, it, the vetch took, took out the sunflowers and, uh, this, you know, it, your, your secondary, um, companion crop affected your, um, uh, and like your cash crop and then weeds, like there's certain years where we've had dirty crops because your herbicide options are so limited. But on the flip side of that is like some of Alex's crops, you don't, you can't find a weed out there. And I've seen it myself. Like there's some, the intercrop, it really helps you on, on weed control, unless you are behind on the weeds and then it hurts you because you don't have the herbicide option. So if you're clean, you're going to be cleaner. And if you're dirty, you can't really clean up. So it's a, it's a, each extreme. I got a text actually that the, our fabas and flax, I thought we sprayed them with a sure, but I guess we didn't even spray them. All we did was authority and uh, roundup this year. So I better clarify that, that we didn't, spray we didn't even spray so if it's clean it stays clean and if it's dirty you can't clean up with herbicides so pick your poison poor you, poor you nick my dad doesn't even watch these webinars so i can say whatever the hell i want <laughs> <laughs> well it's my brother who texts me so <laughs> all right yeah. shoot, alex and then i got lots i'm, I'm probably gonna be like ryan and just talking about all of the time <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Our, probably our worst one was when we tried relaying fall rye with soybeans. It basically turned into zero of both. Well, I don't know. Basically, it, it looked amazing until it decided not to rain anymore in 2019. And then both of them just shriveled up into basically nothingness. They just competed so much for the moisture that it was like 15 bushel fall rye and just not even harvestable beans. Um, yeah. So plus drove over it more. And I think that creates a little bit of an ergot problem on the fall rye. Um, and then this year, I don't know what it was, but that Piola, we could not get after the first try after we could not get the canola to establish and compete with the peas later on in the season the peas just totally dominated them and they turned into nothing and there was nothing we could do about it. I don't know what it was. If it was just this year that the legumes were just a monster, just like you said with the vetch before too, that it was just, I don't know. There's something about it this year in the growing conditions that we had that the legumes and some of the cover crops really took over and the intercrops. I mean, yeah, and I guess I'll have two. I mean, the reason we sow these intercrops isn't, to f isn't to screw up right like th these are sound ideas that should work right so it's like even when i screw it up royally and i'm going to talk about it it's like it's still it's still in my brain like i screwed up there like i can do i can be different so i grew 30 inch soybeans and then went back one month later and sowed uh japanese millet into it thinking that everything would come beautifully. I could get a last pass of herbicide on my soybeans and then the, the millet would come up and everything would grow just phenomenally together. And I got a, I got a legume, I got a, a C4 grass. Um, you know, I can provide feed for my cattle, limited inputs, you name it. And I screwed up on the timing of my last life safe pass. And it was just an absolute disaster, weedy mess. Uh, it separated really easy, which is like positive for the future. But um, I was going in seeding millet into a soybean crop with a whole shank drill. I think there's an option. Um, if I don't, if you don't screw up the pre-emergence millet pass where we can intercrop those with like some cool season legumes for fall seed growth, um, easy to separate, right? The legumes are, are totally functioning. They've formed a relationship with rhizobium bacteria. And, and, you know, hopefully there's some residual end for, for the millet to grow. So that was one, uh, I, I, like, I don't call it a failure. I still think it is definitely a crop we can grow in the future. And the other one is oat vetch in 2019. Like everyone had a wet fall. It looked like an oat field. I sowed 15 pounds of vetch with my oats. There was no vetch at all until August 15th. It started to rain and 
that oat field went from an oat field to a green lush vetch field. And I had to run that through my combine. So it wasn't ideal. It was excellent cattle feed. And I think maybe the, the theme is, um, especially if you have cattle, no offense, Alex, um, but it's just like with these intercrops, we lower, we, our risk level is lowered because yeah, if, if, if something happens where the herbicide doesn't work or, or uh, you know, one intercrop takes over the other, I mean, we're just talking about vegetation. We can feed to animals, worst case scenario. So worst case scenario on a canola crop is, you know, we have flea beetles or we get summer heat during flowering. And, and, but the only thing we can do with that crop is we can ship it to the elevator and get what, I, I mean, I, I guess it's 15 bush, bucks a bushel. But the thing about these intercrops is we just, we open ourselves up to different markets and different uh, profit methods. Um, so it's not just, we have one cash crop, we have a few. Uh, on that note, you guys, I gotta, I gotta actually get to regular people's questions. Um, we're gonna talk about corn vetch because we've had quite a few questions about it. Uh, what you do with nitrogen rates, sowing corn vetch. So of course the vetch provides nitrogen to the system, but not until later. Maybe uh, Nick, you start talk about what you use for nitrogen in uh, corn legume intercrop, and then Ryan, you go, and I can add some stuff too. But go for it, Nick. Well, I'm not 100% sure I'm not going to talk about this. I not a like really tough time figuring out how much nitrogen to put on corn. We put on like 80 pounds to 90. And uh, we use the legumes as top up and I, I'm going to start doing that Haney test and maybe some tissue tests and stuff like that. But the nitrogen, I think the first 50 pounds is huge money, huge return. And then after that, I don't know. How about it, Ryan? Yeah, we're similar to, to Nick, like, the last few years we've been putting 70 to 90 pounds of nitrogen on the corn uh, with the soybeans and a bit of vetch in it. Um, this past year, the corn that we had, we planted it a little bit later into an alfalfa pasture that we grazed hard and then sprayed out. So it was pretty dry. Um, it, it didn't look like it had a whole lot of potential, but we were giving it a go anyways. And then we got that big rain in, in July and it didn't look like it was lacking for the, for the nitrogen. I think it ran out of moisture more than anything, but I think uh, that's probably some sage advice from Nick, like that first 50 pounds or even it goes a long ways where the marginal return is after that. When you start incorporating those legumes is, is you know, it's debatable. I, I do think you need something to get it going, to get it out of the gate, get it established before those legumes take over. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, Reference the same thing, a neighbor of mine, he uses 80 pounds of ESN. He saw the best results corn vetch I've ever seen on, on uh, 30 inch rows, of course. Um, Scott Chalmers has, I, I, I'm positive I was at a presentation of his where he showed data where it really didn't matter about uh, uh, synthetic nitrogen application where vetch didn't care. For whatever reason, there was nit synthetic nitrogen in the system and vetch nodulated anyway. Um, I, I still think, like you guys said, you need that early end boost to get that plant vegetative and growing. I don't know how much the vetch offers to the system that year, but on our 60 inch, 60 inch corn, we were seeing vetch yields, biomass yields of seven to nine ton an acre. And just on basic, um, mathematics taking tonnage and the percentage nitrogen nitrogen of that where it's like it's so exciting for the future because like now we're dealing with two to three hundred residual pounds per acre just growing our corn plants further apart providing that as a feed source for our cows but also the following year where it's like I don't know if we have a nit I, I know we can get away with no nitrogen because those roots uh, are going to decompose and break down, but it's like, do we need FOSS? Do we need potash? Do we need sulfur when we've got a system that's so mycorrhizal stimulated the following year? And I'm going to push both of you guys on this this summer of let's lower our corn population uh, on plants because it's like, 
those corn plants are going to be just fine. They're going to establish and they're going to tiller just like every other cereal uh, does, but we can establish like a low light, high protein, super digestible legume underneath our corn crop. And it's like, now we have the means to harvest that, that, uh, that crop with, with our cattle, even if it is a buck 70 a pound on a 500 pound calf. <laughs> well, and I think that's, there's huge potential for that lower population corn with the vetch and background calves. Like uh, that's something we've talked about here for a few years and never really got the, the plan uh, off the ground to get those calves out in the field, grazing that corn intercrop, but uh, it's in the works for us this fall. Uh, well, Nick, you, I mean, I know it was sunflower vetch, but you talked about your rate of gain on the calves and, and, you know, maybe there's a world where I know it was tough on the cows, but maybe there's a world where, you know, we can, and I got a question here. I will get to about uh, easy wean or the soft wean nose tags on calves, whether that would work in this a system like this. So I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but Nick, why don't you just talk about what your plan is for next year to, to make, you know, to improve your system. So maybe it isn't so hard on the cows. Well, we were always nervous to put the ba to put the calves and uh, like the we were nervous to put the calves back out on the cover crops because they can you know you can have a disaster but if you have a disaster I don't I think you just chase them back into the feedlot and it's called a rodeo and it's whatever <laughs> kind of fun and you learn from it or whatever but I I I just I don't see I think the the it, the, I think the calves would do just fine out there. And uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> thinking that you could supplement feed out there. And I'm basing that on absolutely nothing because I don't really know that much about cows. But I think if you know a lot, then you wouldn't try it. So it's good that you don't <laughs> know that much. Maybe. I, I got an idea, guys. And Alex, I swear we're going to include you right away. We're going to talk about <laughs> Viola. Uh, but I... I that somebody asked me about creep feeding in that situation, but I'm way more prone to raising the wires so the calves can go underneath and the calves can have access to all the high protein, high digestible vetch they want, but it's the cows that are stuck eating the, the stover. And yeah. I guess, I guess, I guess really a guy should do a feed test on the vetch and a feed test on the oats that you're going to creep feed. But it's like, I mean, you saw the, like the rate of gain data, Nick, on, on calves that are grazing this stuff where it's like, it's got to be easy on their gut. Like cows are walking past corn cobs to go graze hairy vetch. Like that must, they're not, yeah. stupid. they're not stupid. I didn't even think of it as, uh, I don't even think as their, their uh, ration as much as I just think, uh, I don't like calling the straw home and the shit out like yeah I, I like just keeping them out there and to that easy wean comment we've tried easy we tried easy weans one year and uh i don't have a very good answer either like i think they work i but uh they're more work so i don't have a it's kind of like putting up cross fence like it's more work but you get a bit back it's pick your poison Okay, hey, sorry, got, Ryan, don't answer that. We got more questions rolling, so I just got to keep going. Um, okay, Alex, we're going to start with you. Talk about what you're going to do as far as uh, P intercrop next year. Maybe Piola intercrop is the, most of the questions we have, but species of peas, species of canola, and kind of your expected yield. Some people are wondering why there's more peas than canola or canola than peas, but I know 2020 was kind of a a weird year as far as piola production. So maybe Alex, start with you. Nick, talk about what your plan is with piola and Ryan, maybe just your seeding rates and expected yield. Okay, so basically on the piola front, um, I guess on the prequel, we tried adding nitrogen last year to, on one field, on a 40 acre field, just to see what the difference would be. If it would boost both yields or we want to see if it how much it'll swing over to canola. We haven't separated it yet, but it was definitely, I would say, 30 to 40 percent canola instead of almost no canola this year. But it had actually overall less tons per acre yield wise. 
like it actually under yielded when we added nitrogen. So we spent like, I think we put 80 or 90 pounds of N down and it was basically for nothing. We actually made less money on it, I think, than when we added the nitrogen, which was kind of interesting. And it also made it mature about two weeks later. And the peas flowered about two weeks later than they did everywhere else. So it really just delayed the whole system. And yeah, there was no point. I think there's really no point in pushing towards the canola but uh, same as last year, same seeding rates. And we're going to aim for, at, like we pencil in 40 bushels of peas and 10 bushels of canola is what we hope for. And if we can get anything better than that, then it's gravy. Cool. Nick, how about you? Um, we're actually cutting back a little bit on our piola. We are big fans of peas with like the 40 tens. They grow so good on uh, like, they yield just as good on weak dirt as they do on good dirt. So they're kind of a no brainer across the river on our lighter stuff, but uh, on our, just the way it's worked out where our canola is going on pretty of our, uh, our, our better land this year. So we're, and, and some of this land hasn't had canola for up to eight years. So we're, we're cutting back and, we're cutting back on the piola and we have some straight canola going in, but we're getting into, or we're going to try uh, growing different varieties together with different seed treatments. So mix. So it's kind of an intercrop, I guess, but it's uh, intercrop of cano like canola. So we have four different um, Liberty tolerant varieties that we're going to grow together and we're going to cut back on the peas. Yeah. Brian. Yeah, at our place, so we're using meadow peas where they are old standby, just a yellow pea. Um, we plant, we, we typically plant our peas about three bushel an acre, like 180, 200 pounds, or, or even, I like to see it heavy, I guess. So, and typically one or two pounds of canola, as low as I can get the drill to dribble the canola out. Um, and we're going for more peas than the canola, it just that's 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 our game we don't fertilize it um seems to work all right so typically with the meadow peas like we're usually running around like that 50 bushel an acre with the upside open if conditions are are right and uh, the the 40 tens the last couple of years we've only grown the 40 tens two years and it's been you know they're 40 bushel an acre 30 30 to 40 in there um which we're we're happy with that so um yeah, that's that's probably all I have to say about. about I'll uh, up, up, I'll m mention almost the exact same thing, Ryan, with our our uh, Clearfield Clearfield canola. We sow two pounds. Uh, we sow like fifty to sixty pounds, forty ten forage peas. But it's like same thing. It's like I want to add more canola to hold up my peas, but the whole purpose of the whole game is to get more forage peas because. Yeah. Why do I want to invest money and seven dollar a pound seed in the canola when it's actually the the forage piece of that are the higher value and offer more to my system? Yeah. Um, okay, you guys, I I apologize. Hey, we got to stop giving prizes away for good questions because we got some really good questions here, and I don't know if I'm going to get to them all. Um, I'm not. He's not getting a hat because he's a dealer of ours, but it's a really good question. <laughs> Darcy Stewart says, uh, Ryan, we'll start with you because I know you, probably you're more versed in this. What about taking off three cash crops instead of two? So what does that mean as far as cleaning or are you using the third intercrop for grazing? Excellent question. Yeah, so I guess our only experience with that is, well, I guess we, so this past year we grew oats, barley and peas together and uh, just combine it together. And we're using that as our supplement for our, our background and calves right now. So that worked all right. We didn't have to separate. Uh, it didn't yield terribly well in that scenario. It was a field that really hadn't had a lot of diversity and no animals on it. it was, it's on some of our rented ground that uh, we don't have fence around it or water. So it lacked nitrogen. It had a beautiful stand, um, had big potential, but we didn't realize that because I think it was shy of nitrogen it's separating is an issue. So with the wheat, vetch and peas, 
the peas are easy to knock out of that. Um, it just makes it, it's just one more thing that one more process you have to have to do. So this past year, the vetch, uh, I had intended on uh, putting peas into that as well again, cause that three-way mix, it just, I think like two, two crops together, you get that third one in. Like, I think the, the weed dynamic is just that much better, a little bit more diversity. It's, it seems to fill the gaps better in that regard. Um, but we didn't get on the field. It was too wet. So, and, and the wheat and vetch alone worked all right. So it all comes down to just what's your cost on cleaning. Um, what, I don't know. I think that several crops are, are not a bad thing. It's just how complicated do you want to make your life cleaning? And sorry, I, I, Nick, you're next, but I'll touch on that where it's like, you got to be friends with your cleaner because it's definitely worth it to clean those out because these high value crops, but it's like, I, I, I mean, my cleaner's looking at me right across the table. You guys can't see him, but it's like, Oh yeah, I've thrown some curveballs at that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, I think we should get you shouldn't be scared of that cleaning cost though. Like, I mean, maybe it's going to cost $20 an acre, which I know, but, it's, like, but uh, just, it's money that's worth spending. If you're talking about grossing six, $800,000. Totally, like, the, the, the small amount of product you need about, of a, when we start to deal in talking in pounds per acre, instead yeah. of uh, bushels per acre, it becomes the difference between 13 cents and 21 cents per acre is a shit ton of money. Yeah. So it's like you can pay someone to clean that if they would do it for money. Yeah. Um, Nick, you're the one with the with the cleaner out of the crew here. Talk about uh, separating more than two crops. It's not that easy. You got to I, I think we can do it, but uh, we've ran even uh, like we got a pretty nice plant and we still run. We've ran things things through twice. So it's not that easy. What do you like? Not that easy to the point where you don't do it. Like, well, you, actually, you I gotta say we've it. never, we've never done three crops. Like we've never done three crops. And then when we do clean, we try and clean for seed quality, like for our own seed. So we're if you didn't if you didn't need seed quality, it would be a lot easier, I think. Right. Yeah. So I I don't know. It's. Uh, Another thing is like the feed prices this year with barley, you know, it'd be pretty easy to sell. People are looking for feed, putting weight on animals and feedlots. If you had uh, peas and barley in a bin, I'm sure somebody would. Uh, it's not as easy to feed for the for some of the feedlots, but I'm pretty sure they would. Uh, they're looking for any ways to save money this year or every year. Um I mean, it literally is as easy as if they're going to grind it anyway, just send a feed test away. You get a mineral breakdown on it and it, it doesn't matter whether it's corn or oats or oats and peas yeah. or whatever. It's like, this is what's in it for protein. This is what's in it for energy. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, go ahead. Sorry. We got, we, sorry, Ryan. I got, I thought uh, I hate telling people not to talk, but I got like questions coming in galore. So I got to stick with it unless you want to be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> go for it alex which one did just you want? three more than like doing cleaning doing three. more than just two intercrops so whether yeah, that's yeah. one can be for relay or if you're separating three crops um well i haven't tried it yet so um yeah i can see it being complicated for cleaning but if it's something like vetch or something like that then it it's a pretty hardy seed so I think it would all be about uh, basically trying to line up three different seeds that are different sizes and different colors and it, it sh and two of them at least being not very sensitive seeds to splitting or anything like that it should make it not too bad. Um, in terms of relaying like more than one, I don't know if we're going to try do more than one crop that we're going to harvest, but what we want to try this year is we want to do where we had the clear field canola and alfalfa, we're going to seed oats into that. And with the oats, we want to seed like half a bushel of fall rye with the oats uh, or maybe a quarter of a bushel of fall rye. So then we have the fall rye and the alfalfa hovering underneath that oats and have those two 
crops basically go into the fall and stay green into the next spring and then probably terminate it the next spring when we seed something else into there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and I guess I'll just touch on, on our farm. Um, we just got a, a quickie clean last year. So we're basically limited to two unless we were gonna run through it again in which I wouldn't do because one of those is gonna be pulses and we're needlessly running it through an auger system. Our third crop is like how long, how much, how much biomass can we create to both balance our soils, but feed animals. Um, anyway, man, you guys, you boring ass guys, one person has kicked off, has left since the questions. So we're gonna stick with the questions if you guys got time. Uh, we got anonymous, it's a good question. And uh, anyway, they don't get a hat because they're anonymous. How do you feel <laughs> with management? Uh, cover crops when taken for grain. I've dealt with cereal, under seeded to clover and straight cut is near impossible. I would add that probably depends on the year, but would need to go back to swathing and risk weather conditions. 2019 with eight exclamation marks. So, <laughs> you know what? I'll start. 2019 sucked, and I had relay crops that, like I said, went from an oat crop to a veg crop, and thank God I had a conventional combine. So, for sure, things can happen, uh, but it's like, in our, in our scenario, we have livestock, so it's like every plant that's growing on our farm is welcome because I can turn it into... Uh, I can put in a ruminant's gut and they can turn that into meat that I can hopefully sell. So we'll go reverse order. Alex, um, maybe just intercrops that's gonna, gonna awry, what to be careful for. We'll keep it quick if you guys don't mind because I got like questions coming in, keep coming in. Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely have started swathing more, but I'm gonna argue that that's probably coming anyways because you can't use pre-harvest glyphosate anymore on oats anyways you can't you're it's going to get banned everywhere in my opinion and probably with good reason so uh, i'm not scared of the swathing thing and i think uh it's going to come back anyways so but it, overall if you're careful about choosing your maturities to line up well or if you choose your varieties well like on the clover side i would probably shy away from something like yellow blossom sweet clover which is going to really get really tall and, and yeah just be wary of what like if you're going into a year pretty wet i would stay away from the taller clovers or things like that just, i don't know obviously sometimes it's going to throw a curveball at you but i yeah i would say that whatever i, I can live with that nick yeah 100 percent agree with alex i just say uh you might have a wreck once in a while. So I don't think you are going to be, I, if you don't want to wreck, like uh, you got to live with the odd problem. Ryan. That's an easy question to answer. You get yourself one of those blue headers. Don't worry about it. Oh, sure. <laughs> Good I, we ripped through some nasty shit. Like, we had one year, it was old. <laughs> that, well, following that season-long cover, that picture, the cows and the big, there was a yeah. whole bunch of sweet clover in there, and it it got rank on us in some oats, and there was vetch in it too, and we just ripped through it with that stripper header. And if you combine any amount of oats at all, I don't know why anybody, like, you need a stripper header because you can, you know, you, you'll you plug your clean grain elevator on the biggest new combine you got with uh, that stripper. And I have yet to see anything that we couldn't get through no matter how big green and rank. And Can I've I had a lot of screw ups with relay cropping and volunteer crop and we, it's not an issue. You can just put it through. So okay, that, do you that's guys, not a concern. I, 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 had this, I had this question written down and we didn't include it in any of your presentations because I, I wanted to ask it now, but Nick and Ryan, you guys both have stripper headers. Maybe talk about the combine capacity increase on monocrops. Just if we could be quick, I got other questions I got to get to. I got to give away hats and a Boyd's beef hat as well. Uh, but talk about the stripper header, increased capacity, maybe efficiency of the combine, and like how the hell does this work with intercrops? Nick, you go first. Yeah, if you got a 9600 combine, you just put a stripper header on the front and paint X9 
on the side, <laughs> Joel. <and you> gotta, <laughs> 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 There you go. <laughs> I like them. Okay, talk about intercrop. So, yeah, I know. I I well, saw a video. I saw a video on Twitter of a guy with my combine going nine miles an hour with a stripper header in wheat that was apparently doing sixty bushels of an acre, which would triple the capacity of my combine currently. Yeah, we've only had them. We've only had them for one year, so I don't have a whole lot of experience, but I love them in cereals. Uh, canola, we, we did them in canola. It's, we, we spent three days um, trying to throw pans and figure out how much canola we were losing. And by the time we thought we had a conclusion, we were done our canola. So <laughs> we're going to keep testing next year. And uh, yeah, I, I like them. Right. Yeah, and the intercropping on that stripper, I guess, well, to go back to the X9, so we run it, we were running a 1680, and and just to give you an idea how much more capacity you get, a couple of years ago, I ran the the wheel right off it, the uh, the the final drive got so hot, the axle, the bearing went and it broke, so we ran the wheel right off it, and then this year, the engine blew because we were running so hard on it, but yeah, Unreal, you can, like you say, an old combine becomes new. Um, it's a no brainer. I think if you're into the, if, but you need a disc drill to go with it. Um, yeah. So intercropping, I haven't been able to make that stripper work on peas. It shells too much. We tried it in the canola too. And I did two passes up and down the field and it was 2019 when we tried that. And uh, I lost patience because I thought it was shelling too much. So we gave up on that. But when you, Ryan, when you said you need a disc drill to go with a stripper header, I saw Nick Cowan's ears perk up like my dog when he hears another dog. <laughs> so Nick, why don't you tell <laughs> Nick, why don't you tell us how the success you've had with the stripper header and seeding with the shank drill? It's tough to believe, but you've yeah, I believe you. No, I I kind of agree. I agree with Ryan. You need a stripper header, but or you need a disc drill to go with a stripper header, but you can. You almost like I I hate disc drills, but I have two. Um, <laughs> if I can Fuck sew it with you. a I shank, only have one. <laughs> wow! Well, if you can sew it with a shank drill, I love everything about a shank drill. I if if I had to pick one, but you need you need you do actually need a you need a disc drill for when it won't work. But try it, and if your shank drill works, use your shank drill, and if it doesn't work quit immediately and go get your disc drill nice i should okay. rephrase that that you need a stripper if you have a disc drill i think yeah <laughs> you'll you'll beat your head against the wall on hair pinning and crap with that disc drill if you're not uh several years down this road where you got some soil structure where you can cut the residue right okay you guys let's talk about intercropping and uh either alternating rows or in um, just everything going down the same shoot, seed, fertilizer, you name it. Alex, what do you guys use? This? Maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about seeding tools. So Alex, you start, talk about um, your guys' strategy with in row versus alternating rows, uh, what you use for a seeding tool. And uh, we'll go Nick and yeah. then Ryan. So we've done basically all of the different options we could through our seeder. We have mid-row banders. So we've seeded using both the seed shoots and the mid-row banders, like alternating. We've done seeding them down the same row and we've done actually separately seeding both crops crosswise, like doing one north-south and one east-west. Um, haven't seen a lot of difference Although my best crop, but I think it had more to do with just the season, was when I cross-seeded my piola. But I think it was just the best overall season for the piola in general. Um, yeah, honestly, I have to say that no matter what you do when you're having big seeded and small seeded crops, for the most part, I've seeded flax over two inches deep and it came out just as fast as my wheat when I intercropped it with wheat or with the lentils when I seeded it that deep. So as the bigger seeds crop. So 
I don't know. I think you get better ground coverage when you alternate and throw them in with the mid-row bander. But overall, I think for most intercrops, uh, other than if you're really worried about the one being really weak at the beginning and not establishing itself, if it has too much competition, I wouldn't worry about putting them, like doing separate passes or separating them. Cool, Nick. Yeah, I would definitely just use what you have. Like I, I'm a big fan of just putting it all in the same row. I'm uh, a big like I. You can blame equipment when things go wrong, but like don't give the equipment credit. Give yourself credit. Like if you put, if you have a nice situation with good cover, you can use a. I wish we still had like. If I could go back in time and keep a flexi coil five thousand and put all the money back that I that I that we've I've spent on drills, I'd do it. Like how about, I, a, Bor they, how about a Borgo eighty eight hundred? Yeah, a hundred percent. Not even joking. Like if you had a Borgo eighty eight hundred, and you just you should still have a Borgo eighty eight hundred, and you'd be growing. You know, we all have that neighbor that has a friggin' Borgo eighty eight hundred who grew out grows beautiful crops and you're like geez why did i spend so much money on my drill when when he didn't so <laughs> well that's me currently but i can't wait yeah, to get well, stick with the 8800 i think i think just stick with what you got use what you with what you got and uh i don't don't think that switching from an 8810 to uh what's the independent mid like i don't know just stick with what you got is my Ryan, I'm going to jump in here just because Nick and I are talking about it. We just uh, we just bought a 750 with uh, actually this guy that's sitting right across from me here. Um, just for uh, the stuff that we can't like literally can't see through with a with a ho shank drill. Um, I am so excited about it. I know Nick and I talk about this every time. Nick says you don't need anything. That 80. No, Joe. Joe, I got to step in there. I think you're spot on. Like use your, use your shank drill as much as you can and then go grab your other thing when you need it. So I think that's right on. That's, that's what I, I got. Yeah. I but also to, to, to hell with you guy with a stripper header. Like that's my, like, that's where I don't need anything more than a 9,600, 9,600 combine because like, honestly, most of the shit I'm putting through the combine is like I needed to go through the combine and then I needed to feed my cows for the winter. So a rotary combine doesn't do me a whole lot of good when I'm like, I just need to thrash it and get it out the back so I can bail it for my cows. Um, but we need, we need to do a better job of spreading the straw that we have. Um, but, and, I, and like, we're gonna use a stripper header of course, but even on something like oats, we'll always underseed uh, but I would just, it would be so nice to go back in with a distrill in stripper headed residue with a legume growing so we can, you know, start to mineralize that, that straw and then put all of that balanced seed in back to the crop that I'm trying to grow. So Ryan, that's probably a good segue to you. You've got a stripper header and a distrill. Yeah. And, uh, I, to be completely honest, everybody's got a hard on for a distril and and i was that guy several years ago we bought a new one a little 30 foot rig and i think you could do without it like there's you beat your head against the wall more often than not trying to trying to get things established nice if it's wet it can be a challenge um but yeah i don't know it it works well it's an 1890 we put everything down the down the tube one single shoot so it's not a it's not a mid-row band unit unit not double shoot so everything we do is all down one one shoot uh single shoot um yeah i don't have a lot to say about that other than don't get carried away people like that think they have to have a disc drill i i agree the old 8800 or the the 5710 borgo you're you know they'll work uh, it's not about the machine. It's about what we're, what we're putting in the ground. Well, now I'm glad my old man isn't watching. <laughs> I, I've been talking about a disc drill forever. Uh, well, I don't know. Capacity though. <laughs> we can I drive seat at seven or eight miles an hour now instead of at five or six. 
with yeah, the dish like, girls, so. and, and, yeah, I, I gotta I, jump in there but you, you can see that seven or eight miles an hour in eli but not in hartney <laughs> <laughs> If we see it at seven mile an hour with the 1890 and it's dark out, you can see the sparks flying. Off the rock. And I guess my theory is with having two seating tools where it's like, of course, like keeping one moving and functioning, uh, all of us have a plethora of shit that we are um, putting down with the seed. But like, I, I like it as like a, our our growing season is so limited. Whereas if I can, even on, on our limited land base, where it's like, if I can get this shit in the ground, uh, timing wise, exactly when I want it, like, it's just, we do not deal with very many frost free days or, or heat units or whatever. So it's like every single day counts, especially in the spring. Okay, guys, we're, we're rolling over two hours here. I got two questions yet. I got to give away a Boyd's beef hat and a covers and go hat. Um, do you feel there is a definite benefit in breaking up hard pan using alfalfa and clearfield canola? What herbicides do you use to set the alfalfa back? Uh, I've done this several times on our farm. We don't worry about the alfalfa. It takes a long time to establish. The canola gets ahead of it. My biggest concern is I'll tell uh, Nick Cowan's story. I was telling him all about the intercrops that I was doing on my farm. And Nick said, what's the herbicide plan here? And I said, oh yeah, we're going to use basogram and Odyssey and Nick says, yep, 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 yep. That, that sounds great. Except Odyssey doesn't work. <laughs> he was basically right. <laughs> so man, yeah, maybe just talk about herbicide. I mean, let's be real, you guys. We're getting into intercrops. What herbicide options do we have when we're talking cereals, with legumes, right? And that's like, these are the systems we're trying to mimic. So it's like, Maybe let's just take this time to talk about herbicide options, overusing Odyssey, overusing Bazogram. Um, uh, maybe we'll go in reverse. Ryan, start with you, then Nick, then Alex. Go for it, Ryan. Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not a herbicide guy, and I've let my uh, herbicide game really slip the last few years. So I, I don't have a lot to say about that. I have more issues from lack of planning my herbicide program but i think like the pre-emergent stuff that soil applied it can can be a, a game changer but we have never we're never organized enough to get that down ahead of time so that's all i'll say about that i i, I can empathize with you on that ryan there's enough shit going on in springtime with calving and seeding and like life that it god it's just nobody talks about that when you're planting a crop <laughs> nick go ahead I like uh, old chemistries. We this year we um, were, I think in 2019 we had weed issues and we were pissed off. We had bad, we had some weed. So our, our number one focus this year was weeds and we had super clean fields and it was super cheap because we use old chemistry. Like we put dicamba in with our Roundup. If we were spraying Roundup ahead of wheat and just, just not, it, it was just kind of it it wasn't uh we didn't go out and buy a fancy herbicide or anything it was like really cheap weed control got ahead of the weeds and that we focused so much on the weeds that i wish we had uh some beans and vetch growing with our corn and stuff like that that we cut back on because we knew that we had some weed issues so next year we'll let the weeds get away and <laughs> concentrate on the legumes but no i'm just joking but <laughs> but maybe yeah. it's all cow feed ben well i think cheap 100 percent be cheap use dicamba some of these old chemistries like uh we were all horny about this product called distinct and uh, we were spraying it in the fall and we were having really great success and it was a new um chemistry that had something in it with dicamba and then we got thinking like, it's probably just the dicamba that's given us all. And you can buy that for like a buck an acre. So what are we doing using these fancy ones? Somebody should write a book though about um, old chemistries and what you can get away with and what you can spray unregistered, stuff like that, because uh, that would really come in handy for cover crops would be awesome. Or intercrops, I mean. Same, same. 
Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's definitely a big concern, uh, depending too much on group twos. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess same as Nick. Uh, try and get some good pre-emergence on some fields that you know are dirtier or – the year before you do an intercrop, you just concentrated on it on it a bit more. But uh, yeah, overall, we haven't had too many weed issues with the intercrops because they seem to be so much more competitive. And if you seed them early enough and get ahead of the weeds, it seemed to be okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and then for us, I mean, on the organic side, we're just using the camera guided integral cultivator in between. So there, you don't even worry about it. So. Yeah. And I guess, I guess for us, we like, I went on a glyphosate. Um, I, I don't know what it was called. I stopped using glyphosate. Uh, <laughs> but that was a tough, that was a tough lesson to learn where it's like, boy, we have some serious resistance issues. Herbicides don't work at certain timing, cold weather in the spring, windy conditions, you name it. It was just like, I did tried to do too much too quick so now we're doing things like fulvic acid with our glyphosate cutting rates back proper timing balancing ph um you name it so but the, it's a huge problem going forward for sure it's something i'm caught cognizant all the time of like if i'm seeding a fall seeded cover crop like what am i going to terminate this with because every single uh, I wanted to talk about growing grasses as far as uh, winter forage for cattle, but um, we're not going to have time, but talk about herbicide resistance and some of the problems with that. Let me, I got a, I got a question I want you guys to be maybe a little long winded on. We're over two hours, but so I'm just going to give away the, this free shit. Uh, Darren Peters, good question about the bricks we never got to. And we're not going to get to, so we're going to give you a hat. <laughs> good question though uh darren so darren peters gets a covers go at and we're gonna give uh oh keith friend gets a boyd's beef hat um what do you guys do for drills that was the question but i'm gonna leave it uh with you guys uh i guess talk as long as you want literally we can't ditch these people look at the boring conversation we've had over the last half an hour and still the same amount of people listening to you guys. So what a compliment. Uh, so here we'll do reverse order. We're going to go Nick, Alex, Ryan, you guys, Nick, starting with you, what cover crop are you excited to try next year or in the future? Just an idea you're excited to try or not cover crop, inner crop, but like, whether, whether you're going to impl implement it next year or in the future, what are you excited to try and kind of what's the concept behind it? So start with you, Nick. We'll go Alex and then Ryan. And I got lots of ideas myself. Well, what was Darren Peters saying there about the bricks? He was just asking about the difference in bricks for yeah. um, spraying, like uh, insect, for insects. I... I honestly, I don't, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about bricks and I don't know what it is and I am going to look into it. Uh, like, I think it has something to do with healthy plants, doesn't it? Or might, I, I, can, I'll, I can explain it quick. So it's like, it's the amount of sugars in a leaf. So the, the, okay. the more a plant, the more sugars a plant has in the leaf, the, the, right, the more efficiently it photosynthesizes. But the thing nobody tells you about bricks is it's totally dependent on previous crop, uh, sunlight, moisture, conditions. I mean, if you really wanted to manipulate a number, bricks would be the number you could manipulate. But if you were testing frequently and had super consistent tests, it can tell you some pretty valuable information like how healthy your plant is. Okay. Um, like... I was looking at Alex's crops and I noticed on our crops too, we kind of scuffed over this is uh, the, I don't know if it has much to do with bricks, but like the, and Ryan's crops too, like that pea crop, it was beautiful. There was absolutely no disease in it. And I think uh, like, I, I don't think Ryan and Alex spray too much fungicide. We quit spraying fungicide a long time ago. 
And uh, I don't know if that has much to do with bricks. We quit, we quit spraying fungicide when I had to miss the Clearwater Ball Tournament. And, <laughs> oh, and then the next year, we won, and then the next year we won the ball tournament, and we made a conscious decision to never spray fungicide again. <laughs> and that was. I know you're lying because you play with me and I've never won. Literally, no, no, no. The year, we won it the year I played with you, my team hey. won it. <laughs> my my brother-in-law, when I could still kind of convince him what to do, <laughs> threw his arm away winning the Clearwater <laughs> tournament, and he's never pitched the same since. <laughs> and we've never sprayed fungicide since. So <laughs> definitely correlation uh, for sure. We're gonna yeah. put this in journals. <laughs> what was the question, though? I I wanted yeah, to get it's, my fungicide. It's, what are you excited as far as intercropping in the future? You don't have to apply it next year, Nick, but just a concept or, or two crops you think have a lot of potential. Okay. I was going to say the, um, well, I got a text uh, about the intercrops is uh, I'm really excited about mixing varieties. We're going to call that the multi-variety monocrop. That's from Brittany Phillips, my cousin. She texts me. She's like, that's a good idea. You just need a better name. So she sent me multi-variety monocrop. That's what I'm super excited about. Because uh, Which actually, is what? what? What species? Four different varieties of canola in the same field. And three different types of oats in the same field. And five different types of spring wheat in the same field. And it's kind of like you get the, you don't get as much a benefit as a true intercrop where you growing different species, but you get different, but you can combine it all the same, sell it the same. You don't have to clean it. It's like, uh, Martin Enns was talking about it that day that we were in Brandon there. And I'm, and I have a funny story about trying that. We do a Hartney community rink field and, uh, one year I was seeding the rink field and there was this quarter section and we left it to last and nobody wanted to seed it. Okay. I'll rip over there and seed it. And they gave me 10 bags of roundup ready canola of 10 different varieties and basically said like, here you go. We got it donated like, and they won't, and we put it in the drill, mixed it with a stick and sewed it. And it was the, it was honestly, on a mediocre piece of land, it was the best crop in the friggin' province. And we thought, why the hell don't we do this on our own farm? And it was good too, because some of the donated stuff, the the reps came and they're like, Well, where's my canola? And I said, Well, just you know, it's the best canola out there. So just put your <laughs> sign wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I, I, this is a side note, Alex, you're next, but yeah, I, I think it's crazy that if you're silaging corn, why would you ever have a monocrop, you know, like the whole purpose, mm -hmm. like if you can access sunlight at different levels, it's like the whole crop's going to be better. And we're just, the name of the game is game is capturing energy. So it's like, I think there's huge potential, maybe not in our climate per se, where it's like our growing season short, but like where you have unlimited growing season, why the hell are you ever growing one variety of one crop in a field? It's like, just spread them out and they take advantage of minerals and sunlight at different periods of time. It just makes so much sense. So I like it, Nick. It's a great idea. Alex, your turn. So we've actually been doing what Nick said uh, on the organic side because we wanted different levels of shading. So we've done it with like wheat before and we want to do it with oats and different things like that too in the future. But um, we were told by a mill in Quebec that they did a bunch of trials out in Quebec and now they want to do it in Manitoba. Is they were getting, uh, it depended on the combination of different varieties of wheat, but they're getting up to a 25% yield increase from mixing different varieties together of the same crop so that's pretty huge uh i think it's an awesome idea for us uh honestly it's uh we're i know you guys talk about it a lot but it would be new for us is hairy vetch and corn we want to try it on a with non-gmo corn and we want to try it on the conventional side and on the organic side and on the organic side with just mowing in between the rows and do it on 60 inch rows 
uh, for weed control and then put cows on there and then basically replace our green manure year so that we're basically just grazing. Hopefully we break even on the corn just from harvesting the corn. And then we want to work with a neighbor and do some custom grazing. And if we can, uh, then basically any money we make off of that is gravy. So that's, that's something we're really excited about and really want to get, want to try. It would be totally new for us. There hasn't been a fence on our farm ever that I can ever remember. So it'll be cool. Nice. Ryan, how about you? What are you excited about? Well, I'm excited about vetch and I'm, uh, the wheat vetch thing. It's one of those, we didn't get any platted last fall. So we're always kicking ourselves. So it'll be next fall when we get some more of that in the ground. And then the corn vetch, like, uh, I think your 60 inch vetch, those pictures speak for themselves. There's so much potential there. Um, that's, yeah, I'm a vetch man. So I, I might have some for sale. So the, the covers and coal guys, <laughs> you'll have lots of supply. So we're good. The world is out of vetch, man. Yeah, it's it's, be. You and I are. <laughs> uh, I, I got a show uh i got a couple homemade projects here talking about 30 inch corn these are st statistically uh this is 60 inch this is 30 inch but like look how flat those are I'm, like these are statistically scaled down um metrics for 30,000 plants an acre it's like look how much more efficient that is than that the sunlight spectrum whereas like all we're doing is growing different varieties of corn that are capturing sunlight at different levels so i i didn't think this was going to be a show and tell time but <laughs> but yeah it's just look how much more surface area we have to capture energy where it's like that like nick the idea and alex obviously you guys are implementing it it's such a good idea we're so used to in conventional agriculture driving by a, a perfectly flat field Right, we drive by and think, "Damn, that's nice. No weeds, all one plants, all the exact same height." And if Mother Nature was driving by that, which she is, or in the sky, like how wasted efficient is that? One flat canopy where all you do is add a little bit of spectrum up and down. Look how much more sunlight we can capture. Like we can, we can just capture more energy that grows into our soil but our seeds as well that gives us return. Um, okay, you guys, we've been on for quite a while. I, and not that we're losing anyone. We still have, most of the people are still here, but uh, I really want to thank you guys for your time. Um, I think it was awesome. Hopefully we get some usable material from this. We'll have to cut all Nick's out. <laughs> 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 no, but you, honestly, That's, guys, no. Thank you. hey, cut mine well, out. Cut I'm yours just, out. Cut it out. I actually don't. <laughs> I, it's true. No, you're all here for a reason. Y'all did. Don't an excellent, whatever an you excellent. do. Don't show my crops anywhere near Alex's crops. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you notice none of my crops were on here. <laughs> all right, you guys, for real. Thank you guys for coming on. It was as, as insightful as I had imagined. Guys are leaving now. So you guys can yeah, go yeah. In, enjoy your night. Have a beer on Let's us. Go. And man, we we appreciate your guys' time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. Bye. Bye.